Hey everyone, and welcome to Faith. My name's Matt, and we are so glad that you've decided to join us today. Wherever you may be watching from and whoever you may be watching with, we just want to say thank you for joining us and deciding to spend about the next 45 minutes or so with us today as we continue in a message series called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. It's based off a book by Andy Stanley of the same title. And what we're going to talk about today was my favorite chapter of the whole book. So I'm excited for where we're going today, and I hope that you get as much out of it as I have. We'd love for you to share this message on social media. It's one of the ways that we believe we can spread the good news of Jesus across New England with as many people as we possibly can. If you'd like to partner with us today, the best way to do that is simply by going to faithauburn.info and clicking the button that says give. You can give a one-time gift or you can have a scheduled regular gift set up as well. And because of your generosity, we're able to do what we do today. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity. If you're new with us, we'd, uh, we'd love for you to just fill out a connect card by connecting with us further in that way. And we'd encourage you to do that by going to faithauburn.info or you can text the word connect508 to 97000 or you can scan the QR code on your screen right now. And we'd love to help you get connected this season. And with all that being said, our weekend experience is here and it all starts right now. Hi everyone, I'm Doug Gies and welcome to part four of our series, Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Many want to leave as little margin for error in their lives as possible, just like leaving for work or curfew. You know, I could stay in bed another five minutes and just make it to work on time. I can hang out with my girlfriend another five minutes and still almost get in before my curfew. I can have just one more drink and be just under the limit when I come home tonight. We humans have this propensity to push the limits on certain things. One more minute, one more bite, one more pair of shoes, one more one night stands, but one more is rarely enough and never adds up to anything good, usually. Life's not a fairy tale. If you lose your shoe at midnight, it probably means you're drunk, just saying. There's a natural inclination in all of us to live as close to the line, the edge as possible, the line between it, the legal and the illegal, the moralish and the immoral, the kinda and the kinda not. We love to flirt with danger. So here's what we tell ourselves. It's not wrong, it's all right. It's not over the line, it's fine. It's not immoral, it's acceptable. It's not illegal, it's permissible. How bad can I get without being bad? How close can I get to doing wrong without actually being wrong? How low can you go? So think of this scenario. How close would you allow an unattended toddler to play near a swimming pool? 10 feet, five feet, one foot? One might argue they aren't wet yet, come on. There was water in the womb and that they swam around him. There comes a point when they're just too close because one small step could result in tragedy. When dealing with toddlers and swimming pools, there's no margin for error. Did you know this? There's a road in Bolivia called El Camino de la Muerte, the road of death. In 1995, the International Bank christened it the most dangerous road on the earth. It goes from La Paz, capital of Bolivia, at about 15,000 feet in elevation, down to the Amazon River, about 45 miles in length. One estimate says that between 200 and 300 travelers are killed yearly along this road. Why is it so dangerous? Three reasons. The extreme drop-offs are at least 2,000 feet. It's a single lane width, most of the road no wider than 10 feet, and a lack of guardrails, which makes the road so dangerous and so tempting. I mean, that's what's so amazing, isn't it? Because it's so dangerous, it attracts crowds of people. 
It has become a major tourist attraction, especially for bikers. This past week, I decided to travel on my own version of El Camino de la Muerte, better known as Wachusett Mountain. I had not been skiing in over 30 years. And no, it's not like riding a bike. <laughs> Just saying. Before I even snapped on a ski, I vowed to myself and my family that I was just going to take it easy, you know, no crazy stuff. But as the night wore on, I decided I could get a little bit more daring, go a little faster, push the limits until I hit an icy patch. And while trying to stop, I spun around and am now going backwards down the mountain. So when I was younger, I used to do that for fun, but now that I'm 60, my whole life just flashed before me, and in that split second, I wondered which hospital would they be rushing me off to? Now, fortunately, I didn't panic and just twisted around and regained control. That was my last run for the evening, by the way. It's like us all to want to push the limits. I guarantee that all of us, somewhere in our lives right now, we tend to live life on the edges. There should be another factor, though, in play, in making good decisions. So we're in this series about choices. Life is about the choices you make. And the choices you make makes you. Life is decided by decisions. Your decisions determine your destiny. The first question which enables us to make better decisions, the grid, through which we can make right choices starts with the integrity question. Am I being honest with myself, really? See, we all have the tendency to lie like a rug to ourselves. We are our own worst enemy because we don't see ourselves or who we really are and who others see us to be. We deceive ourselves. If you've ever bought something, that you didn't need with money you didn't have to impress people that you didn't like, then you weren't being true to you. The second question is equally important. It's the question, it's the legacy question, what story do I want to tell? I mean, when folks are standing around my casket someday, what are the stories I want them to tell? Stories where they don't have to lie, they don't have to skip chapters. I, I need to live today with tomorrow in mind. And of all the options that are before me today, what are the ones that I want to have as my permanent record? The third question is the conscience question. Is there a tension that deserves my attention? Am I conscious of my conscience? Am I aware of that still small voice of God within that's nudging me? to do or not do certain things? Am I paying attention to the tension? And am I hesitating long enough for God to move, for God to speak, to clarify what the right thing to do is in this particular circumstance? Today is the fourth question, the maturity question. What is the wise thing to do? I'll bet that your greatest regret was preceded by a series of unwise decisions. They probably weren't completely wrong, they just weren't wise. Am I telling your story yet? I, I am mine. It was that remortgaging that should have never happened. It's that trip to Disney that should have been postponed. It's, it's a million and one things that weren't immoral or illegal, just not wise. The girl that you took to the prom who everybody says she's bad news, run for the hills. Not wrong, but certainly not wise. Can I be, be so bold today to say this? It's the foolish person who lives on the precipice and travels near the edge of what's dangerous. And there's a scripture for that. Actually, there are many that kind of highlight the wisdom of wisdom. Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 5, he says this, Be very careful then how you live. The Apostle Paul, the former persecutor of the church, now transformed believer is telling the Ephesian church to be careful or put negatively, don't be careless. Have great care in how you live. You and I must ask ourselves, how prone am I to snuggle up and get as close as I can to danger and stay there as long as I can before I get bit or before I get burned, before things go awry? The literal translation here says, look carefully how you walk. I like that. Our world is a little bit like my backyard. 
I have a nice deck and a gazebo on the deck and we love it and we spend a lot of time out there in the summer. But the minute that you walk off the deck into the backyard, you better, <laughs> you better be watching where you're walking. Because every morning of every single day, a certain little Tibetan terrier named Max goes out to do his thing. And if you're not careful where you step, you'll regret it and you'll track it into the house. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just a metaphor for life. Look carefully how you walk and where you walk. The Ephesian Christians, the ones who Paul's writing to, were living in a city that was rife with the black arts, with demonology, witchcraft, and everything else that goes along with that. In the first three chapters of this book, Paul is reminding them of their new life in Christ. The beginning of chapter 2, he states that they were once dead in their sin and transgressions, but now because of God's great love for them, he made them alive in Christ and raised them up to new life in Christ. But they must be careful because all around them is darkness. And if we're not careful, they will, we will, will stumble around in the darkness. A famous English author and poet Dorothy Sayers once said that some Christians, probably most Christians, can be too often likened to what we call bit players. Do you know what a bit player is? A bit player is a walk-on at a studio who plays through a brief scene, a shot to which they're cast, and then they just leave, unaware of the meaning of the drama in which they just starred, ignorant of whether it's a comedy or a tragedy, drama or melodrama. It's true. As Christians, we can tend to forget that we're players in an invisible spiritual conflict that has existed for millennia, that we're very much a part of it. And, and we can tend to be bit players in the spiritual war that exists when we ought to be so much more engaged, so much more aware of the spiritual challenges that are before us. He goes on to say this, live not as unwise, but as wise. Wisdom should be for us the quintessential trait that we all should desire more than anything else. An entire book of the Bible was written about the topic of wisdom. Approximately 3,000 years ago, David the king had a son whose name was Solomon. And when Solomon became king, God asked him what he desired. Wealth, power, fame. And Solomon asked for something far greater. He asked for wisdom. God was pleased with that and requested, uh, that granted that request for Solomon. Solomon became the wisest man to have probably who have ever lived. Solomon then took it upon himself to compile a collection of the wisdom that he had accumulated over the years, presented this collection to his own son to help him attain wisdom and discipline and acquire a disciplined and prudent life. That's Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. This collection of wisdom is what we call the book of Proverbs. It's the original life's little instruction book. And it contains advice for getting life together and keeping all areas of life together. Now, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge, or shall we say, intelligence. See, you can be a genius and still a fool. In the first chapter of the Proverbs, Solomon heaps up nine different words to describe wisdom, like discernment, understanding, discretion, and prudence. Wisdom isn't merely knowing information, but it's knowing what the good is in the situations of life and thus doing it. One of the more goofy characters in American sitcoms is that affable and laughable George Costanza on Seinfeld. In one episode, George decides that he's tired of being a loser. He's in his mid-30s, broke, unemployed, desperately single, and lives with his parents. He is sitting with his friends in the coffee shop one day, and he realizes that he has gotten into this shape probably by following his own natural instincts. And it's his natural instincts that has brought him nothing but misery. So he decides that from now on, he's gonna do the exact opposite of his natural instinct. In fact, he says, I normally order tuna on white bread, but today I'm gonna to do the opposite. I'm ordering salmon on whole wheat. And throughout the whole episode, George does the exact opposite of his natural instinct. By the end of the show, his life has turned around. He is dating the woman of his dreams, he's gotten a job with the New York Yankees, and he's moved out of his 
parents' house, and he's now in an apartment living in Manhattan. Now, all this happened because he just decided to stop following his natural instinct and start doing the exact opposite. Now, it's a sitcom. It's silly. It's supposed to be. But there's a kind of a hint of truth here. Proverbs 14, verse 12 tells us, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. See, our natural tendency is not towards that which is wise, but toward that which is foolish. If we follow our natural instincts, we'll find that many of the things that seem like good ideas at the time prove to be miserable, miserable in the end. In order to succeed in life, we need wisdom from above. And Paul contrasts the notion of all other philosophers and religionists of his day, that the knowledge of God is something that you reach up for and attain, kind of like this upward mobility of divine information. It doesn't work that way. Because gospel didn't work that way. The gospel of Christ is the good news of divine descent, not human ascent. This was the foolishness of the cross, that God came to us, that he forgives us and accepts us apart from our effortful striving. And God offers wisdom to anyone humble enough to ask for it and accept it. It's like the beach with a severe undertow. We see the warnings, we can read the signs, but we sim swim out anyway and think everything's just hunky-dory. It's a beautiful day. The sun's shining, the water's warm, I'm getting a great tan. Until the undertow of our own human reasonings, our own decisions begin to pull us downward and further out to sea. And fueling our incessant flirtation with disaster is an unexamined assumption that informs our decision making. It just says this, oh, we'll be fine, we got this. The unexamined assumption, a lack of divine wisdom, is a dangerous thing. It's these six words, these six words here, which Paul discloses to the Ephesian Christians is the grid through which they ought to be making better decisions. The grid through which they should be evaluating every invitation, every option, every opportunity that is afforded them. Divine wisdom should be the standard, the yardstick for making all financial, relational, professional decisions. Paul's making a case for a special kind of wisdom that is not an earthly sophistication, but it's the wisdom that comes from God. It comes through prayer, it comes through reading his word, it comes even through uh, being with fellow believers. Paul follows that up with some really good advice here. Now, the next verse says this, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Literally, it says here, redeem the time, buy it back, get back what you lost. Don't you wish you could do that? To buy all the bad moments of your life, to buy them back. Wouldn't you like to have that do-over? You know that time you said those harsh words to mom and dad? That one night of drunkenness that dominoed after that into a series of really terrible things that you did? And maybe for some of us, it's reclaiming seasons of our lives where we're just spinning our wheels. So whether it's days or weekends or whole seasons of our lives, imagine having the opportunity to relive it. Imagine how your story might be different now. Now, as painful as it might be to remember, to remember the past, it's helpful because it helps us going forward and to leverage that most precious commodity that you and I have. It's time. It helps using this great asset and use it to produce for ourselves a preferable future. Remember what philosopher George Santayana said? Those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Or to say it bluntly, those who don't pay attention to what got them into trouble yesterday are liable to end up in the same trouble tomorrow. We do this. We remember the past because we know what kind of days we live in. They're evil days. I'll bet you already knew that. Every day of your life, you're forced to interact with a world that is weirdly and strangely foreign to the ways of God. It invites you to live fast, satisfy your appetites, go for the gusto. Why not? What could it hurt, you know, indulging just a little bit? Long gone are the days when you had to go looking for trouble. Today, it's just a mouse click away. Today, it's so easy to flirt with the darkness, just like 
the Ephesian Christians. And just like them, Paul's alerting to us the perilous times that we're embroiled in, that if we don't pay attention, if we're not careful, we'll pay an enormous price, which could even be the cost of our very own soul. And now those are Jesus' words, not mine. What will it profit a man that he should gain the whole world, yet lose his own mortal soul? This verse is like the alarm clock of the soul, isn't it? It's that annoying buzzing going on in our ear, calling us to wake up, and all we want to do is just hit the snooze button and go back to sleep. Paul concludes by saying this, Therefore, do not be foolish. Andy Stanley says that if punctuation were available to Paul in the Greek language, which it wasn't, he would have ended this with an exclamation mark, maybe even three of them. Don't be foolish. Understand what is at stake. And don't take this lightly. Your Christian life isn't something that you put on on Sunday morning and then take off when you get home later on in the day, kind of like a bit player would do. It needs to consume all of our being, all of ourselves. And Paul says we're just fools if we aren't. But understand what the Lord's will is. Understand. It's easier said than done. My brother Sam Maisonette, our student pastor, is currently finishing up his seminary degree with one last course, Greek. You know, you just save the best for last, right, Sam? Last week, our brother texted us on Saturday night while he was uh, obviously studying. And here's uh, what he texted to us. Uh, Ta Helenika enai sclera. It took me a little while, but I finally got it. Greek is hard. <laughs> yeah, it is. And this brought me back. I remember the days sitting in Greek and our dear professor Gordon Stock and godly man would just simply call on you in the middle of class saying, Douglas, can you translate the next verse in John for us? And I'd do my best. You know, I'd try to be faking it, recalling what the gist of that verse was in my mind. And I'm sure you could tell that I wasn't prepared. I was kind of faking it because then he would ask me after I kind of, you know, botched it all up. He says, do you understand what you just read? No. To understand means to perceive, to comprehend. A Christian should be one who can in any situation perceive what the perfect will of God is. I know that's a tall order. It means that your mind is, needs to be so saturated with the mind of Christ that you can discern what Jesus would do. Your brand new mind, the part of the new creation that God has begun in you should not be operating with worldly wisdom, but heavenly wisdom. The prophet Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would come and that the Spirit of the Lord would rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Jesus came into this world full of grace and truth. You need to become full of God's truth. Becoming a, a Christ follower, not just a believer, means you comprehend what Jesus would do and you do it. To repeat God's life in this world, to imitate him in the outpouring of his love, his forgiveness, his sacrifice, his speech, his purity. It means that everything becomes subordinate to the mind of Christ. It means that my politics, my morality, even my professional ethics, decisions that I make about my relationships, everything. Paul, in employing the language of his day, is in effect taking us by the lapels and saying, stop playing games, quit rationalizing. Quit compromising with the world. Face up to what you know is right and do it. It means facing up to our lifestyle, to the people we date, to the people we mate, and stop thinking that you can live your life in two worlds because you simply can't. Remember earlier I said, there are things that are not necessarily wrong, but they're not right. Right for you. Your past predisposes you to certain lures, addictions, temptations, that if you're not wise, careful, cautious, you could fall. Consequently, what's right for everybody else may be off limits to you because you just can't handle it. What some people consider a harmless pastime is perhaps for you a harmful pathway leading to something destructive. Others can handle their liquor but you can't. Others may be able to be on the computer late at night, but you can't. Others may be able to watch an R-rated movie, but you can't. Others may be able to eat dessert, but you can't. Because one sip, one bite, one glimpse could set your universe on fire. 
Chances are there are places you have no business attending. Chances are there are people that you have no business spending time with because they're simply triggers for you to go deeper into a place where you shouldn't be. In light of your past, what are the wisest choices you can make now in regard to your whatever, your entertainment, your hangouts, your business trips, your whatever? I know people who can't use credit cards. You know, why? Because it gets them in trouble every time. And they've just decided they don't want the, the temptation anymore. It's ruined them before and they don't want to step in it again. So what we're saying is this, in everything, I will do the wise thing. The wise thing to do is always God's best for you. God's best thing for you, it's the wise thing to do, always. The foolish wander about, the wise travel too. The fool just walks about, not really caring too much where they step or what they step in. But a wise person walks carefully with eternity in mind. Start now to be what you want to be forever. Start now to be what you want to be forever. Eternity for you starts today. Wisdom makes good decisions today that will be good tomorrow and forever. They just are. And wisdom makes the hard choice between what I want now and what I want most forever. A blessed life by God, an eternal future that far outweighs anything on earth. So make decisions today with the kind of tomorrow you want for your life. Before you close, before we close together, let me try a couple of examples on you. So we've had a ministry here in our church for many years now called Divorce Care. It's been my privilege to be a part of it for some years. And one of the things that we always kind of say to newly divorced, that you don't enter in a, into a new relationship on the heels of your old relationship. Jumping back into the dating game soon after a divorce or a breakup is almost always a, a gateway decision to regret. The person isn't ready. It's not that it's wrong, it's just not wise. I mean, there's no one size fits all time frame, but my counsel is usually this, that if you're recently divorced, take out your calendar, mark one year from that date that your divorce was finalized before you ever start looking at another person. Now, some of you are looking at me like I've got three heads right now. The point is, you need to be patient and wait on the Lord. Now, how about if you're getting married? Now, I've ached, literally ached over people who I've seen get married way too quickly. I've never heard of anyone ever attribute their marriage problems to the fact that they waited too long to get married. Never. And usually it's the opposite. I have known people, heard their stories, usually in divorce care, that they wish they had waited longer to get to know their spouse, the kind of person that they were, not the person that they assumed that they were. I mean, that was my own mother's story. She only knew my dad for nine months before they got engaged, got married, actually. She did not know the real man that he was, only the guy she hoped he was. My counsel to folks who are dating is this. You should be dating at least a year before you ever get engaged, and then at least another six months to be engaged before you get married. Why? I, I don't have a Bible verses to support my theory, the perfect timing for dating and engagement. Why such strict rules? I mean, you already know the answer to this, right? Because it's the wise thing to do. How about friends? Some of you probably have friends who are simply not good for you. You're making the decision today to associate with them even though you're ruining chances at a blessed tomorrow. If your goal is to become more like Jesus in the days ahead, why not start hanging out with people who will build you up, help you in that goal of becoming more like Jesus, rather than spending your days with people who are tearing you down? You are who you hang out with. See, the wise see danger ahead and steer accordingly. The foolish keep going and pay the price. Don't just settle for that which is legal or permissible tolerable, not prosecutable. If you do, you will eventually find yourself living dangerously close to regret. You're better than that. You deserve better than that. Your family deserves better than that. 
And it has broken my heart so many times to see people engineer for themselves a very unhappy future by making those very unwise decisions. They're making decisions today that are ruining their tomorrows. I'm sure right now you have some idea of what you want your future to look like. You have a mental picture of your preferred future. What could be, what should be, how you envision the next season or two of your life. And life is hard and there are plenty of dream wreckers out there. It happens all the time. And it comes from all different sources and different directions. You've watched friends undermine themselves financially through some very unwise decisions. You've watched friends probably sabotage, the, sabotage their relationships through drug, alcohol abuse. You've watched, I am sure, you've watched families break up, children no longer talking to their parents or their siblings, all because of some strong emotions and some very unwise speech. Don't be your own worst enemy on this one. Set your life on a wise course and see the blessed results of becoming that person God wants you to become. In everything, I will do the wise thing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this great opportunity to study your word and to, to begin to see its application in our lives. We know, know God, that our lives are made up of a series of choices. And for so many of us, we've made some good choices along the way, but we've also made some very poor choices along the way. Choices that are not necessarily evil or, or wrong, but they're just not wise. Help us to receive God from you, the wisdom that only you can give. We're asking for it right now. For some of those who are listening right now, God, they're, they're humbly seeking you, humbly asking right now that you would fill them with your wisdom. They want to know what your perfect will is for their lives. And Father, I'm confident of this, that he who asks the Lord for wisdom will receive it. So God, come to them, fill their minds, fill their hearts with what is the correct course for their lives. God, we thank you that you are a God who does indeed communicate with us, that wants to share the good, the right, the holy, the wise with us. So do just that, we pray, God. Again, we praise you and thank you for this time together. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you all. Thank you so much today for listening to us. Have a great day. Faith Church has proclaimed 2021 as the year of pressing on. Our press on campaign inspired by the Bible verse from Philippians 3.12, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on. It will be a year-long strategy of encouragement, inspiration, and spiritual nourishment. I invite you to check out our new webpage, which includes the Press On Campaign tab. Let me demonstrate for you right now. Here are many resources that you can find to help you grow and become more resilient in the months ahead. There's even a place where you can give to help people afford biblical counseling or find biblical counseling in our area or online. I want to draw attention to the many resources that are available and designed especially to give help and assistance on a number of different topics, from support groups to YouTube videos to helpful books to even some very helpful apps. Check this one out. It's called the One Minute Pause app. Do you go throughout your day feeling like a little disconnected from God sometimes? You're busy in the rat race of life and realize you've gone hours without thinking about anything remotely spiritual. This app will help you reconnect with God in the middle of your day. Try it out for one week and see how much it will help. Download it today. It's free. Take the challenge and give one minute in the middle of your busy day to restore your union with God. May 2021 be the year where we press on together. You have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me with joy, that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. 
O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever.